All right. So you guys, this is the National Association of Christian Women Entrepreneurs and Karen Lindwall Borg. I don't know what my new company is actually being called, but it's being transformed as we speak. Uh, I think it's Raymond 3E Services. We're going to talk for the entire month in NACWI on leveling up your culture. And I'm going to say your the culture of your life and the culture of your business and your ministry, because it all ties together so intimately as I understand it. And so welcome. We've been talking about leveling up your entrepreneur endeavors all year. Next month, we will start for about two or three months in a row talking about leveling up your social media. So stay tuned for that. Um, but let's talk about leveling up your culture. We are the National Association of Christian Women Entrepreneurs, lovingly called NACWI. And we're here to bring Christian women entrepreneurs a connected community, enhanced education, networking opportunities. I know there are lots of groups where it's just really not appropriate to shout from the rooftops who you are and what you do, but we are a group that loves for you to do that in a particular setting and there are instructions in our groups on how to do that. And then we want to promote a missional mindset and a very, very prayerful mindset. And we pray for you every Monday at 930 in the morning. We used to do this on Thursday, switched it to Monday. And we pray for you every day by alphabet, alphabetically. So you are a prayed for group. And I, that's one of the things I love about us the most. We're going to start off the month uh, with Lou Kralchev as a co-host. I've known Lou from almost childhood. <laughs> She's been with, uh, with our family for years and years, and we've gotten to, it's been a privilege really, to watch her grow through the company that she worked with for over 20 years to the point that she was a director at a high level and promoted culture. And I, I say this, and I always caveat it, Lou, by saying, in my humble opinion, I think you have been responsible for the health and welfare and um, not just health, but the enhancement and the, the thrive of their restaurants, especially overseas, because of what you know about culture, because of how you tell stories masterfully. And I've, I mean, you're the only person I can think of, not the only, but one of the few people I can think of that years, years, years later, I still remember the stories. And there's a reason for that. And I think you're very gifted in that area. So Lou is a culture strategist, um, launching her own, launch her own company and kind of revising it right now. And we're just going to have a culture chat. So anybody who joins in later, they're going to have to leave their mics open. We're going to have a chat. This will be posted as a replay in our group a little bit later today. And we'll continue this entire theme for the month. We'll hear from Lou as our co-host. Throughout the month, we'll hear from Ellie Nieves. She's a lawyer and a leadership strategist. And we'll hear from Angela Freeman Scott, who is a communication strategist. Um, and then the last week of the month, we think we have a big surprise for everybody. So we'll catch on to that Oops. a little bit later as we go. I'm going to start doing, oh, there we go. And pray us in and let Lou get started. Father God. I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful that Lou has been a part of my family and my um, business and ministry life for years and years and years. I love what we've been able to do together. I love the way that you've gifted her with um, a view, a broader view than mine for most things in life. An understanding of culture, because I think it's something we don't talk about and don't understand well. And Lord, I love the giftedness you have given her um, as someone who thinks outside the box, who's passionate, enthusiastic, and a master storyteller. And I'm just praying for all of us who join listening to her and the rest of the team this month on enhancing and cultivating culture for our lives and for our businesses and ministries as well. I love that the Latin root of the word culture means care, and that's what that's really the caveat, I think, of what we're trying to do is care for one another as we grow as Christian women entrepreneurs. So I just pray for her and for everyone else who will join in the conversation today. And um, we just pray for an expanding of our borders, Lord, in a way that we understand uh, what culture looks like and what we want it to look like 
and how to get it to that place. And we ask these things in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. All right. Hey, Dr. Sandra, we're having a major conversation today. So if you can, you might as well just unmute and talk, we're going to talk about culture. <laughs> picture all right and you're muted Lou I don't know if you knew that okay hi guys uh hi. so happy to be here hi ladies I always say guys I don't know why that's ladies yeah, happy to be here uh today uh we're gonna chat about culture I feel like I've given so many talks over there it's, it's like once a year I give a talk on culture and I'm like I gotta shake it up I'm starting to sound like you know like a broken record. I'm going to mix this up a little bit. Uh, but really it's, you know, I just want to have a, I love culture. I'm fascinated with culture. I'm fascinated with organizational culture. I'm, I'm really fascinated with entrepreneurs as single, you know, members of an organization <laughs> building a culture. Uh, and thinking about culture from the front end instead of, wait, 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 we got to like, we're not behaving the right way or, oh, we're not doing these things or we're not using the right language. But like, as an entrepreneur, you're the first person that sets the tone for what your culture is going to be as you grow. And that also extends into clients. It extends to partners that you work with. Um, if you have freelancers that do consulting or contract work for you, all of your culture you know, flows out to those people as well. And so I think it's, it's for me, it's as a, as a solo entrepreneur as well, it's so important to think about this, design it. Um, there is some room for default, I say, because sometimes you need a little organic matter to help, you know, come in and, and integrate. But then you also, if you can design it well and really think about it, you know, once a quarter kind of go, what's the culture? Am I on, am I on the mark? Do I, am I building the brand I want to build, not just from a profit perspective, but from a, um, um, what's the word, um, uh, reputation, you know, and recognizable, right? Uh, I think a big brand like uh, Nike, Starbucks, you know, all these guys started out one little shop, right? One little shoe, <laughs> one little design on a paper, right? They were all just one guy at one point and decided to build something. And um, they are so recognizable and their culture is so um, iconic. Um, you can go into any of their outlets, any engagement, and you recognize it. You know, you're like, I'm in the Nike shop, I'm in the Starbucks. So I use those big brands sort of, you know, to say, wow, how did they make that happen all the way from the first drawing to thousands, millions, right? And keep it. And I think it's because they told the story so well, they defined things so well, they grabbed onto values, they grabbed onto purpose, and that became their rally cry, you know, and this is who we are and that's not who we are and this is what we do and that's not what we do. And so all of that probably was real murky and blurry in the beginning, but as they, as they grew, as they got stronger, as they got bigger, it got tighter and tighter and tighter until where it was an identity. Um, and so I could just talk about this for weeks on end and I have, I, I, as a, as an entrepreneur, I go into companies and I help them see their culture with fresh eyes. Um, I also do a lot of like cross-cultural education, um, helping people work with, you know, multiple cultures. I do some diversity, um, and inclusion, belonging, um, equity work, um, as well. Uh, and so going in and, and I'm one of those people that's like, we keep trying to do things the same way we're doing them. And it's going to take forever if we keep going at that pace <laughs> on some of this stuff. And so I'm kind of the person that kind of comes in and rips open the blinds, lets the sunlight in and we see it all, right? <laughs> we see the dust on the tables and the nicks in the chair, 
but you got to see that, you know, you got to see it to, to really understand it. And that's probably the hardest thing about culture is it's so hard to see. We see pieces of it and we think everything's okay because we've got a vision and a mission on the wall, but we don't have the behaviors that underpin that, you know, and we don't have leaders that, that emulate that. And so a lot of the work that I do is just about really helping people shine a light on it, not be afraid of it, not be scared of it, actually welcome it because it's, it's the most human experience. This is what we do, culture. This is what humans do better than anything else, right? If you, if you think about it, we gather together, we, we clump up together and we do things. We build things, we grow, we move, we do all these things together, but it's all for purpose. I and think so one of the real talents you have is getting them to not be afraid of looking at things from different angles. And me too, I went through a culture program with Lou. And so I'll, I'll give an example. In the counseling world, the term is homeostasis. And the, the idea behind it is even when you know you need something to change, in a moment of distress, you revert back to what you're familiar with. Even if you know it's not really the healthiest thing for you, but because it's familiar, it's something you've become used to. So to me, I think one of your greatest talents and greatest challenges has to be getting in there and helping people to shake it up, mm -hmm. throw out some of the old, bring in some of the new, yeah. Well, and we're afraid of change yeah. because in, in I, I, that's the, the biggest thing I've learned so far in 2020, 2021 was this myth of homeostasis. It's a myth. It's a, it's a whole thing. We, we get a job and we think I'm going to stay there forever. I'm going to retire from there. It doesn't, it doesn't exist. Like I'm going to buy a house. I'm never going to move. I'm going to, you know, marry my husband, things happen, right? You know, what, whatever, but there's, actually we are changing every single day and if companies don't address the culture and they think we're going to use the same vision and mission from 90 years ago which was very nice and relevant but none of the behaviors are there we're guess what the behaviors are changing but not in the direction you want them to unless you're really aware of it um, and so I, I just wrote a research paper for um, I'm working on my master's degree and it was all about, we need an anthropologist in business. You know, we need someone to come in and we'll do an engagement survey and our engagement survey will be the measure of the culture. And it's like, it's not, it's a moment in time. You need someone that can look at the language we're speaking. What are the, an engagement survey will never tell you about the, the quiet frontiers, the little borders that are built up between people and teams, right? They'll never tell you about like, you know, and then the word that comes through the engagement survey is marketing needs to work better with operations, right? And that'll be the, you know, but it's actually, no, we need to fix the barriers. We need to knock down the frontiers that are, and then we got to figure out who are the fence builders and who are the fence openers, you know, and an anthropologist, or even if HR could start to understand some of these ethnographic practices, um, they would see the, the qualitative data, which would tell them where, where the issues are. It's not just, I've got a best friend at work and everything's happy, you know, <laughs> it's like not. And so, that, so it's much more complicated. I just saw an interesting article in the Financial Times that Google's actually bringing in ethnographers now because mm -hmm. they realize they've looked at data very flat, quantitatively, flat, 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 and they're like, we didn't get the whole picture. We would have completely designed things differently had we had an ethnographer tell us about belonging, you know, interaction, sociability, the affinities. That doesn't come through at all in your one, two, three, four, five data, right? <laughs> so it's very interesting. Um, I think we're on a, a little bit of a horizon, in my opinion, in the business world about understanding culture a little better. Um, I think for 20, uh, and I, in my paper, I started the paper very, I tried to be not so snarky, but I was a little snarky as I was like, you know, it was, it was the early 2000s, Peter Drucker said, 
culture eats strategy for breakfast. And the business world went, yeah, let's have culture, quick, quick, everybody. We're gonna paint the vision and the mission on the walls. And we're gonna give you this little card that's laminated that you can put in your wallet and look at so lovingly all the time about how much you love this company. <laughs> No. And it was nice. And they meant well. That's the thing. I don't mean it mean. They meant well. They really knew this was important. They thought they were going to make culture a process. They thought they were going to make culture a procedure. Mm -hmm. And we we're going to do it once a year. And we're going to have values day. And we we're going to have a great company. And it was like, but you didn't do the the day-to-day -day culture building, the day-to-day -day fence building or a bridge building. And and that's the thing. And I think as entrepreneurs, as single entrepreneurs, to know this thing from the beginning is power. Because then you think, how am I going to lead this group of people when you've got seven contractors that come in and do different tasks for you, but you still need to have a team meeting? How am I going to lead them and not just hand off tasks, but how am I going to say, here's what we're building, right? And you're, you're building your culture as, as well as your business, as your sales, right? And so they go side by side. And I think that's such an awesome opportunity. So. But you're right. We're stuck in this rut. We want a recipe and a result, right? And when you were talking about the engagement survey, I wrote, I wrote it down. I thought this reminds me of when I'm going to get really practical with you. And then you can take it wherever you want to go, Lou. Okay. But, um, we did, we used to do all of our NAC weekly webinars at 10 a.m. Central Standard Time, Tuesday mornings. And then we decided to take a poll and we said, hey, when do you really want us to do NAC webinars? Thinking people would respond and then they would show up, right? People responded like crazy. And the biggest vote, if you want to call it that, on a poll was for 2 p.m. Central Standard Time, Tuesdays. We switched it to 2 p.m. Central Standard Time, Tuesdays. And most of the people who voted for Tuesdays, 2 p.m. Central Standard Time, <laughs> never showed up, you know, and, and a few other people showed up. And, but, but I thought, okay, there was more to be seen in that question. There's a huge, which yeah. is where I get stuck and need your sort of help. Yeah. Um, I still think inside that box of, well, this is what we asked, and these are the answers that they gave us. But there were a lot of other variables we should have been looking at or maybe other questions we should have been asking right. well and to me that expands to culture mm -hmm. that's such a good but and, and, and it's like we'll take that you know pull that democratic effort you know as truth and actually we're you know you kind of go okay the people that voted for that are those big players are those culture builder players that voted on that like you know i mean as you can see, but like, it's almost like you need to know, like, you know, who are your, I call them butterflies and bumblebees, right? They are the pollinators. They are the ones that, build, that you need these people in your sphere as well as part of your, as, as if you've got a group, if you've got members, whatever your business model is, right? Customers, you've, you've got some people who are natural butterflies and bumblebees who are going to tell the story about NACWI or, you know, LukeRollJub.com or Nike or whatever, right? And they're going to be excited about what I learned today. And they're going to be the ones that invite people to come, right? And so I do think that's so true. And so it's back to that, like you look at data, a flat line of data, but you don't see the nuances in the answer, like you said. Um, and so, yeah. I know it's a learning lesson, but hey, as an entrepreneur, we get to do that. I learn a lot and try things, right? So culture does have a purpose. Um, it's to help the group survive and succeed in their physical, political, and spiritual environment as measured by their own success criteria. So this is, you know, we're going to build this business. We're going to build, you know, build business A. Um, and here's why, you know, and um, the culture, all the things around it, the behaviors, the actions, the, the uniforms, the, you know, the sales pitch, whatever, all of those things are, have these nuances of who you are as an identity. Um, and then it's all there to help you survive and, and create an identity strong enough to survive 
And then we measure that success by how far we said we wanted to go, how high we said we wanted to climb, not what Wall Street says we had to climb, but what we, we set our own targets and we set our own. And each time we, 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 we hit one of those milestones, we celebrate as a culture. And so um, I think this is an interesting concept, I think for entrepreneurs, um, because so much of the time, at least I can only speak for myself, we are just trying to make it to the next mm -hmm. invoice, you know, like the next pay, you know, client, you know, the next, and we're not thinking about kind of, okay, the culture I'm building with my business is yes, I need to build clients and I, but alongside that, the, the culture I'm cultivating is helping me survive, helping me succeed in my, you know, for us, physical and spiritual environment, right? As Christian women, right? Um, and then do we have the right measures? Do we put the measures in place to say by, you know, six months from now, I want 10 more new members or three great clients? Or do I just get some people around me that are butterflies and bumblebees, right? To help me, you know, propagate, you know, and, 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 socialize what we're doing right that can be a measure but i think it's it's important to think about that any thoughts on this before we move forward i like what you're saying um so much lou and it reminds me of course of what we do uh when you say that culture has a purpose and everyone should know what that purpose is to be in alignment on where the team is going or where you're going mm -hmm. um i met this morning with a, another networking group and we just focus on our power the power that we have as individuals and the power that we have collectively. And so your idea of the, who are the bumblebees, who are the pollinators, you know, who are the butterflies, who's taking the message and working it, making it work for everybody else. So I think everything that you're pulling together here, it has merit and it, it shows us the vision where we going with this thing. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, funny enough, I uh, will talk about vision. So, so here's the other thing that's, you know, when I talk about, um, you know, brands and, and companies that, you know, they say, oh, we've got this great culture. And I hear this a lot from mediocrity. And I'm like, you had a great culture. Mm. You, you had the good behaviors. You don't, and you're living on a legacy right now. You are still riding a wave of something that does not exist anymore. And yes, it's part of your brand. And yes, it's a legacy you have, but you're not doing anything that instills the behaviors and you're not doing anything that creates culture. And so I love this phrase, culture is behavior and behavior is culture. And I think people have to recognize it's not just the dress, the clothes you wear that say, I'm from here, I'm from this brand, I'm from this country, um, I'm from this, you know, ethnic group, whatever, um, it's, there's also behaviors that are attached to that. The reason I wear that clothes, the reason I wear this necklace or this hair, this bracelet or this long shirt or this, you know, these all tell a story about who I am, you know, and what I believe, right, um, in many ways. Um, but the same thing is true with language. The same thing is true with just interactions in the office, interactions with clients interactions with partners. And so we have to be, you know, I think like if, if you could just know your culture is the first thing people feel from you before they even talk to you, like before they even met you, you know, they, they, like your, I would say your energy arrives at the table before you do, you know, like they, they can see you from across the room and they'll start to make, it's, it's sad because it's, it's, it's stereotype, it's assumptions, but if we know that, we walk in in a different way. And so I'm walking in. I remember Karen and I went to a um, book launch party in New Orleans and Karen walked in. And I mean, we were coming off a road trip and we were, you know, we were pretty rough. You know, <laughs> we got ready in the Wendy's bathroom. We were, we were fancy. And, but, you know, she walked in there with this just air about her and I was like you look like a publisher you walked in like a publisher and she was so proud because she was invited to one of her book launch things and I thought you're emitting your culture there 
you're emitting so much of what you are. And it's funny because I mean, that doesn't mean we have to be like, we can even be a hot mess and still emit a great culture because we can be relaxed. We can be casual. We can be, and we, but we carry that stuff with us. And I think it's just important to be aware of that and ask ourselves, what are my behaviors? You know, what are behaviors I want to cultivate? I do have to say I had a major pollinator with me for X <laughs> 11 hours in the car on the way there. So <laughs> that helped. And I think the author too, now that you're mentioning this terminology is kind of coming alive for me, was a pollinator. She was so proud of her book, right? And she didn't even live in New Orleans, but this New Orleans group got, you know, knew someone who had this major home and they did this book launch for her and they did, they did it in a way that, you know, she was the queen bee. And it was a celebration. It was, she gave birth, you know, to a book. And it's something to be celebrated and commemorated with a ritual, like a party, you know, like a launch party. So many times we don't even, well, ritual is a whole other thing. We'll do that next week. Uh, but it's a whole thing that is precious, you know, and we've gotten so dismissive or that our inner judges or our own, like, I shouldn't bring too much attention to that. You know, I need to have more humility. No, you have to shout it from the rooftops, like you say, Karen. Um, and so some of these rituals sig signal that. Um, so. But I think Love. Dr. Sandra said, you used the word alignment a couple of minutes ago. Yeah, I, I was, yeah, I was thinking of alignment uh, for, oh, I'm adding to that, thinking of alignment and keeping the culture fresh mm -hmm. because that's what Lou was saying. It's got to stay fresh and you are a part of a tribe that, I mean, you know, you're headed in the right direction and alignment is that we're thinking the same thoughts, we're all creative and let those creative juices flow. Mm -hmm. uh, and Lou, you said, <laughs> you know, in the movement, you can't be thinking about what you did in the past. Those were past victories. You've got to do something right now today to keep it moving forward. And keep that, like, why are we here? Why are we doing that? You know, and it's just, it's lost and it gets lost because leaders can't articulate it, not to their own fault. We're just not teaching that. We're not teaching. We don't have all these classes in MBA programs, you know, which you think they would. And then I find out, no, they don't. Um, or they might have a one semester in an HR class where they've got 12 other topics and culture is one of them. And I'm like, it shouldn't be in an HR class. It should be in a leadership class, you know? Um, I'm going to, I'm going to change that one day. Uh, but, <laughs> but I do agree. Like it's, it's, it, it gets flat. And I also think is romance in a way. Um, we have to keep falling in love with what we do. We have to keep falling in love with why we do it. Um, and when we fall out and it's okay, like I said, nothing, there's this myth that everything lasts forever. There's also times when it's like, I need to move on and I need to pass this on, but you got to make sure you go to a new tribe, you go to a new village, a new country, that same tribe still is there because they still have work to do, you know, and there's a young generation coming up that we have to you know, pour into, actively pour into and create your replacement, you know. Um, but I think we're conflicted because we have this thing. And I think in our, our society specifically, you know, we don't quit. Quitting is for losers. And so with this idea that you stay the long haul until something abrupt happens. And no, we should really be thinking about. And if you look at like you know, I, I say indigenous people, but old cultures, you know, indigenous people, that, that is what they are. They, are. they are intentionally teaching their kids from the time they're born up through their teen years when they become men and women, how to be these people, how to be these leaders, what are the lessons we have? And we've lost some of that. And I think we have an opportunity to redefine some of that and bring some, we, create new ones, but the same sort of, I guess, uh, practice. But we also don't think that, I love this when you do this multiple times you've done this because it change, it, uh, it's kind of painful sometimes, but it changes <laughs> my thinking. It changes mm -hmm. my perspective a little bit. So we don't also in our culture, society, ask these sorts of questions. 
Like what sort of culture do I see when I look at Nakwi? Or what sort of culture do I want to see when, or do I want people to see when they look at Nakwi and that sort of thing? And I think you're slowly, painstakingly, I'm gonna say it again, teaching me to look at things. And that's what I thought of when Dr. Sandra said alignment. How many times have we worked with someone, myself included, when uh, their entire alignment changed because they weren't doing what they were really called to do or aligned with who they really were in the first place, mm-hmm. shock of all shocks, then we discover some things about ourselves, our dreams, our aspirations, what we want this to look like, and it changes a lot. I started to say everything. Sometimes it changes everything, but it changes a lot. Um, this is where we need to start. Mm-hmm. not where we need to go once we're already established and you know I mean exactly. we still need to do that too but what but we, we get busy and we, we get busy and we get you know we get the you don't have time to mess around with all this you need to you need to get this done you need to finish that book you need to write that presentation program whatever and then but I think there's just this there's this art and I'm doing it as well I mean I'm I feel like at times I'm like, why, who am I to be telling anybody about this? Because my own thing, I'm still like, you know, limping along a little bit in some ways because I can help other people see things all day long, but I still struggle defining, but I have done so much work in the last three to four months on it to be like, no, I got to lead this well. I don't want to be limping. I don't want to be like, oh, doing all the actions and I'm not making the impact because I'm not leading through culture you know, and that's what builds your reputation. That's what builds your identity. People know you. I went to a- Back to that, uh, the title of the book in your other slide, Fish Can't See Water. You can't always see your own environment or culture because you're in the smack dab in the middle of it. You know, it's part of who you are. Yep. I think that's where we all come in with each other. So, you know, great cultures have vision. Um, they know where they're going. They see, uh, they can see off, you know, where do I want to go? What do I want to be? And I think we do that from a business perspective. You know, I want to be here in five years or in, you know, a year I want to have this many clients or I want to have th- this many programs or, you know, I want to be able to reflect, we, you know, we set those sort of visions of, you know, who we want to be as a company, but I don't know that we always set it for the culture of the company. Uh, and so I'll give you a second, um, let me give you like two minutes to think about when it comes to the culture of your business, what do you see? What do you want to see? What do you, you know, what is that going to look like when you arrive? Thirty more seconds. Thank you. 
guys are very diligent. You guys are very good. I'm so impressed. Y'all were getting it. Y'all were in there. I want to, does anybody want to share openly or um, you want to share? Yeah, I'd love to. All right. I wrote, I want to, oh, I want to welcome, help and mentor people who are ready to grow, change and manifest their knowledge, skills, abilities and possibilities and to create things right now and put some action steps into the, all of that planning and move like they have authority and, a co and confidence. So I want them to realize that they can do uh, what they say they want to do. Now, just think about this, Yuga. That is beautiful. Just think about if, you know, you had a building and all of those clients, all of those people were in a room, the energy they would have, because they were people that were ready, right? And they were, imagine the, the, the effervescence of energy this group of people would have together if they were a tribe, if we were a tribe, if they were in a group, they were in a building, they were part of a company, they were part of your team. They are because they're part of your, you know, your clients, but that is that and look, I think there was such powerful language. It's a vision for your company, but it's also a vision for the energy, the culture, the language you'll have to use, the, the vibrancy, uh, the energetic vibrancy of that experience. So much of that would, I think, um, be present just from hearing you say your vision I can immediately see but the the behaviors of people we're ready sitting like what would their behaviors be like high-fiving keep going shout out like there, I think there would just be a lot of that going on I think what that's a say, I say a lot of uh shouting and expressions and smiling and whoop whoops you know a lot of uh activity to show that they're ready they're they're about to burst if they don't get this thing out and start sharing it uh you know the world would go crazy so they're ready to release this mm -hmm. so that everyone can it can share in that experience and so if you were like if you were a business like a you know a standing box and we all walked in we'd actually be able to feel some of that oh yeah and, yeah. and that's the thing you got to cultivate that's the thing you got to cultivate through the way your brand looks through the language you use to engage with people, through the materials you prepare, through the speeches you give, all of that has to come out and it invites people in, right? To participate in that. Even the people that may be scared and shaking in their boots, right? Mm -hmm. yes. There's a bunch of people behind them saying, come on, I'm behind you, you can do it. Right. And there's something really, and that's great culture. That's, that's a great culture vision. So thank you. Thank you. All right. How about someone else? So Angela, you're muted. I don't know if you, but I'm calling you out because I know you wrote something down. <laughs> yes. Um, what do I see? I see thousands of Christians who have been equipped and empowered and encouraged and they have, decided they're going to live who they were created to be and that they are going to be engaged in their life purpose and a life purpose that will multiply themselves and others and that will leave a lasting legacy and not just a legacy for the future. You know, I want it, I want them living a life that's going to count for eternity, but it's going to count now. They're going to see they're leaving a legacy that they are empowering themselves and others, and they're just alive with purpose. Mm -hmm. That's so good. And I think that's another one where it's, look, it's, you know, you, you've got a group, group A, you know, that's like hot pink I'm thinking hot pink I don't know why I'm thinking hot pink <laughs> vibrant energetic and then you have you know group B which is your Angela uh that is just this like cocoon of birth of purpose right 
-hmm. and look how very different you are, but you're both taking your clients on the journey where they need to go. That's all, right? That's all. You're the facilitator of them, but you both have such different air and language and and that 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 same thing Angela you have to cultivate that so how do you cultivate the space the language um the signals the symbols that that the, the celebration points you know what does that look like in your group that takes people through that journey and I think like just think about that as as a culture if you were if we I would say tribe because it's just it's easy for us to imagine what does it sound like in there? What is the music? What is the drum beat? What is the, what is the circle look like, you know, when we're sitting there in these spaces and it, they're going to be very different depend, all of our personalities are all different. We're going to bring our own culture to that, but we relay and we do our work through that culture, um, through the behaviors, through the language. So very good. And then Karen. Yeah, I mean, we know you, Dr. Sandra and Angela, and you're already doing those things. It's mm-hmm. like, what, what needs to happen next or what needs to look a little different? So I thought of NACWI, of course I did. Mm-hmm. I love And I thought, what are we, what is the culture, the future culture I wrote, it needs to have increased energy, focus, service, and increased camaraderie, increased hands-on opportunity, maybe more leaders, uh, we've had leaders, you know, under my direction kind of come and go. Maybe we need chapters across the United States in the countries. We're already in Guatemala, Canada, Peru. Um, I can't remember where Pam is drawn a blank there. And I also thought maybe we need, I can just see small groups kind of coming together because we have such a wide 14,000 people. We have such a wide variety of people. Some of them really only want to be here for the connected community. They're not even really ready to launch anything, but some are launching. We have people who are startups and we have people who are millionaires. Uh, Maybe they need smaller groups that are focused more on their own dreams, needs, and future. And, you know, how do I cultivate that? That's where I've been. That's good. And I think for you, you know, you've got so many people in your audience. And I think to to your point, it's the, the engagement piece, the, the connection piece is the, it is the sauce. Like I'm going to, the next, I think, is it the next slide or the slide after it's all about belonging. Okay. Culture, cultures create belonging. There it is. Okay. You just set me up. Perfect. We didn't even plan that you guys. We planned. <laughs> so cultures create belonging. The reason people stay in a place is because they feel like they belong or they want to belong. They're trying to belong. A lot of times people will go to a company or a church or a women's group or a, a entrepreneur group and they're, tr- they're looking for belonging. That's why they come. That's why they gather. That's why they spend the time. That's why they sign up. Cause I'm like, I need, you know and this is like, so, you know, human, right? We want to belong to something. And I think, um, to that, to your point, Karen, I think the thing, NACWI has the bones. NACWI has all the bones. It has the pieces. It has a huge library. It has an opportunity to come in here and learn. It has a place to post. What, what's the key that creates belonging, you know, and that's being seen. Mm-hmm being recognized yeah I was thinking individual attention how do you do that you don't do that with 14,000 people but it's hard to do that with 14,000 people but if you did it with a quarter of that or a a 10 percent of that five percent of that what would you know what I mean even that's a huge number but Mm -hmm. um but I think you know great it, it that just made me think but great cultures do create belonging and I also see cultures that aren't great that they just can't create belonging. They, they're a place to come for a transaction. I'm going to come to this office and I'm going to work my eight hours and I'm gonna get my paycheck. But I'm gonna feel like an outsider. I've seen this, you know, I've seen this in, in so many places. It's people, people get hired into an organization and, and, you know, or a team or a restaurant, a shop, 
And then it's how do people welcome them in? So when you were talking about maybe I have a team, <laughs> maybe you have a team, you know, mm -hmm. that's just for, from NACWI, that's just like you're only onboarding. You're only, you're in this phase. But I think, you know, as single entrepreneurs, you know, um, the new client you get, you know, those first 90 days is all about establishing belonging. Mm -hmm. um, when you know, and, and so I'll, I'll ask you right now, maybe, <laughs> how do you create belonging? Um, and is it, is, and, and how, you know, and how, tell me, write down how you do it. Like, what's the process? Um, and then you'll be able to tell, is that too light? Was that too mechanical? Was that too, was it genuine, you know, belonging and welcome? So write that down. I'll give us uh, another two minutes. About 30 more seconds. And okay. Um, I'm curious on this one because I have so many ideas <laughs> on this. I was over onboarding in my company um, for many years. And uh, I, I remember when I took it over, it was, uh, um, you know, a, a horrible binder that we had to put together that no one ever read. And <laughs> it took forever to do it because you had to, you had to go in and change their name on every page, even though no one ever read it. And, and, you know, here's your binder, here's your schedule, you're going to go meet all these people. And that was it. And it was like, that was, it's not, it was okay, but it wasn't, it wasn't an experience. It was like a, you know, a, you know, it was like a little puppy on a leash. Come on, we're going to go here, here, here. And I was like, no, we got to change this up and make this personal. We have to make this a, an experience. And so curious to see what you guys, what you have, and then maybe some ideas that popped up for you. So who wants to go first? One of you. All right. I hate silence. <laughs> okay, Karen, you go first. No, I said one of you. <laughs> okay. okay. I wrote down some thoughts um, and uh, they include how to create belonging, build relationships, take genuine interest, Ask how you can serve them. Ask what opportunities they are looking for. Ask questions that build and execute the dream that they have. Be a mentor, be reachable and teachable and trust the process and the power of connecting. So good. Yeah. Well, that's it, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> I 
sounds great. So it yeah. sounds, you know, it sounds like, yeah, we, we can add a lot to it, but, and then you can simplify it. I would say take five of those things away and pick three and do mm-hmm. those three things, you know, mm-hmm. and three of those, if you do those three things, those other five things are covered in those three, most likely, right? Yes, <laughs> I agree simplify because you can get like I can't breathe there's too many people to call or you know but it's it matters right it just matters Angela do you want to share yeah um I'm looking at it from a little different perspective now because what I want what I'm trying to highlight in my business is that I want to be a speaker and a workshop leader for groups that that need to encourage their groups and need to get their groups moving and growing So I was looking at it from a little bit different light than what I would have in the past, the coaching light. But um, I loved how Sandra kept saying, ask, ask, ask. And that was, that's just right on board. But I need to reach out to event planners and them a quick response time if they respond to me. I need to ask questions about what is your event going to be like? What do you need when you want a speaker? What do you need when you need a workshop leader? What is the biggest problem your group has or what is the biggest opportunity you see for your group? By asking those questions, then I can better connect with them. And I can also be a resource for other people, for them, other contacts, if I'm not the right person. Mm -hmm. Be a resource of other speakers and leaders and connect them. Uh, I need to relate to their needs and I need to be flexible with what I offer so that it will fit the needs of the group. I'm not going to change who I am, my core presentation or anything like that, but I need to make it adaptive mm-hmm. to what they need in their group as a, from a speaker's point of view or a workshop leader's point of view. Um, I need to be prepared and that's including not just my speech and my extra offers, but also the, the terms of agreement that I want to be able to present to the event planner so that we can agree on what I'm going to do, what I'm going to be paid for, what they will receive, what benefits they will have. And then I need just a lot of follow-up, just keep following up on it. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, that to your point, you know, it's, um, there's a, there's a, but then I would chat, just like I said with Dr. Sandra, you know, just simplify that pick three of those things pick three of those things and start there because if we try to do the laundry list of too many things people feel that so it doesn't feel like belonging quite it feels like a checklist right and so they're just I would just that's my caution on it right Mm -hmm. and it's like you know just think about like ask you know what do you need here's our services, let's come to this agreement. But it's really that engagement that creates the belonging. It's really that I'm here, I'm so glad, you know, what are we, you know, and belonging comes when you teach them the language they use. Belonging comes when you've given them something, you know, that says this is a signal for signing up today with me. And, you know, you may get a signature item, but everyone's like, wow, that is so you know, you, right. That is so, so working with you. And so I think, um, just think about those things because all those things weave us together. Belonging is about weaving, right. And weaving is the back and forth and the in and out and in between. I know we have three minutes left. Karen, tell me, um, what do you write? Well, I'm going to borrow from Angela being an adaptive to a degree, right? Resource, like you said, I'm not going to change who I am or what I present, but, and really from Dr. Sandra, I'm going to borrow the wonder of it all. I remember as a grief counselor since 1995, one of the most powerful things I was ever taught was just to wonder what can these people in their moments of you know, deep despair teach me? So that I'm a better, a better helping professional. But I started with the same things you guys started with. Ask good questions is the first thing I wrote because people want to weigh in. They want to be heard and seen, like you said. I think well, welcoming them, giving them individual attention. How do I get to know them? I noticed you did this or that. What do you think about this or that? Congratulations, birthdays, anniversaries, and special 
events, um, maybe how do I meet the need? Um, I, for example, with, when we talk about asking really good questions, I, when someone signs up to be a member of NACWI, I ask them questions. You know, you understand you can only promote on Marketplace Mondays, right? They say yes. And then I say, what are your greatest joys and challenges as a Christian woman entrepreneur? I save all of those answers and I have hundreds of them. So then, but I'm not using them, right? But there's a treasure trove of information right there. I realize it's the kind of go back to the poll question. There's more to be seen there, but I don't go back and address those issues. Or, and we welcome people in little groups. I don't welcome people individually and say, I notice, you know, when you answered the questions, one of your greatest joys was, there's not that. And maybe doing a little more of that would be, I would enjoy it. Or get a person, get someone who can, you know, I mean, with that many people, maybe it's, who are your butterflies and bumblebees? You know what I mean? There may be some people that I could write, you know, I could do that. You know, you could add people. Like someone says, I'm a writer. Oh my goodness. These three people are writers in our group too. Exactly. Yeah. But I think it's down to, and I go sometimes with scale as we grow, um, things get jiggly, like the, the wheels get a little wonky, you know, and when you're small, you can give that attention, you know, um, but like, you know, for, for, I worked for a big company with 70,000 employees and you wanted to automate onboarding, like, okay, well, it's a relationship with their line manager and their team members. It's not a relationship with, you know, a, a desk in Dallas, right? You know what I mean? But there's some things that you have to automate and get and gather and all that. But then there's the relational piece. And I think it's just a being aware of, are we creating belonging? Um, and what would, if you were a stranger coming in, how would you feel right now? You know what I mean? Where would, and, and I think it's empathy, right? It's just empathy. Right. Of, and, and I think like if you can, and, and there's statistics, I don't have them, but there's all sorts of statistics about this belonging and onboarding piece, this welcome piece and how it sets the tone for everything else. It sets the tone for everything. And so I think that, you know, great cultures create belonging, but they cultivate belonging. Because sometimes you can be like, you're the new guy, come on in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then like, they go to lunch by themselves or they, you know, they never feel like, I don't know where I participate. I don't know, you know, I come in and I'm invisible. Um, and so I think, you know, great cultures are really seeing who everyone is. And as they grow with scale, you need more people to help do some of those things. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I know we went way over and there's still more to this presentation. The next slide, we're going to do this next week. So I'm back next week. And we'll do part two yeah. and we'll just continue this. And I'm going to appeal to Angela and Dr. Sandra and I'll be there too, to be the pollinators. I'm sure we can get after we get far away from Memorial Day holiday, we can get more people yeah. here. And, we'll and I'll share two more as well. Um, we do want to hear stories. I'm always saying, tell me a story. <laughs> yeah. Tell me a story about whatever. <laughs> I got stories. Awesome. Thank you. You guys, lukrawchev.com. It's going to be changing before your very eyes, but take a peek at it. And thank you, Lou. And I'm looking forward to part two, part two, Lou, and uh, to being with you guys again next week. God bless you. We'll right. see. Thanks, Lou. Great job. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Sandra. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Karen. You Bye. take care. Bye. Bye.